You can open your Bibles with me to Matthew chapter 12 as we continue our journey through this book of Matthew. We're just a few chapters away from the halfway point, now a uh, year or so in. I can't, when did we start, Alan? <laughs> he keeps records. A little, over a, year ago. a little over a year ago. And so we're enjoying this journey through the book of Matthew, uh, verse by verse. And so open with us to Matthew chapter 12, and this morning we'll be in verses 15 to 21 together. In the two weeks before Easter, we saw two different public confrontations between Jesus and the Pharisees regarding proper observance of the Sabbath. They didn't understand that He was Lord of the Sabbath. And in fact, those confrontations got so heated that we see by Matthew 12, 14, that the Pharisees went out and conspired against him how to destroy him. Death was on the line. But it wasn't time for Jesus to die yet, and he knows this. So to avoid a riot that might end in violence against him, Jesus would occasionally withdraw to the countryside as he continued on in his ministry. In fact, after Jesus brought Lazarus back from the dead, there was such a stir that the ruling council... Um, in John eleven fifty three 53 and 54, it says they made plans to put him to death. Jesus therefore no longer walked openly among the Jews, but went from there to the region near the wilderness to a town called Ephraim. And there he stayed with the disciples. He would continue his ministry. Large crowds would come to him. He would heal them. He would teach them. Um, but this became a pattern throughout his ministry as he carefully ministered and taught, careful not to provoke something that would lead to his death until it was time, the time appointed by his father. And so here in verses 15 to 21, Matthew mentions that Jesus withdrew after these controversies, and he explains why Jesus did this. Matthew uses his oldest quotation, his longest, rather, quotation from uh, the Old Testament, four verses from Isaiah 42, Isaiah 42, 1 to 4, and he uses this long quotation to teach us something about the shape of Jesus' earthly ministry. He explains why Jesus would occasionally withdraw and do his ministry in the countryside, but he goes beyond that and teaches us more about the shape of Jesus' earthly ministry in general. And I want you to see six things about the shape of his earthly ministry as we move through this passage together. I'll read this passage and pray for God's help one more time in just a moment. But I'll say this, uh, as our nation becomes increasingly hostile to the truth of Scripture, increasingly hostile to the idea of absolute truth at all, then it becomes increasingly important for us to learn to live in a hostile world as Jesus did. If you take your cues from anyone in the world, perhaps political pundits or many people's favorite online commentators, whether they're commentating on the news or happenings within the Christian world broadly, uh, you would think that the way to live in a difficult world is to pick every fight and win every argument by shouting the loudest and most creatively insulting your opponents. Well, this is not the way Jesus lived in a hostile world. It's not the way Jesus responded to controversy. So it's important for us to see and lay hold of these six truths about the shape of Jesus' earthly ministry so that they might shape our lives as we represent Christ in this broken world. So let me read these verses for you, and we'll pray and ask for God's help one more time. Matthew 12, verse 15, Jesus, aware of this, aware that they were planning his demise, withdrew from there, and many followed him, and he healed them all, and ordered them not to make him known. And this was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. Behold, my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved with whom my soul is well pleased, I will put my spirit upon him. And he will proclaim justice to the Gentiles. He will not quarrel or cry aloud, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not quench, until he brings justice to victory, 
and in his name the Gentiles will hope. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you would work in us by your Spirit. Father, just as salvation is a miracle that you work in the hearts of sinners with an application of your spirit. Father, every day our sanctification is an ongoing miracle. We need you to work in us by your spirit to understand your word and to have the strength to obey it. This is your work in us, Father, a work that we must cooperate with if we are to grow and submit to you and become more like Christ. And so I pray that you would strengthen us in this moment to understand your word, and as we go about our week, to obey it more thoroughly. Father, would you shape our lives more and more like the shape of Jesus' earthly ministry? We pray this in his name and for his sake. Amen. Verses 15 to 17 to begin. If you're taking notes, and there is a notes page in the past to help you with that, I want you to write down as number one that Jesus' earthly ministry was announced by the scriptures. What Jesus said, the way that he carried out his ministry was announced by the scriptures. Jesus, aware of this, withdrew from there. Many followed him and he healed them all and ordered them not to make him known. He continued his ministry. All the things that he had been doing, he continued doing, but having withdrawn now to the countryside. Now, why did Jesus do the things that he did Why did he say the things that he said, and why did he do and say them in the ways that he did and said them? I don't know if you know this, but Jesus was following the plan laid out for him by the Father through the Spirit in the Word, self-consciously so. Matthew tells us this was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet. We've already said that Jesus withdrew from time to time, and what that accomplished practically But Matthew explains why, more fundamentally, Jesus did this. He was knowingly fulfilling the prophecies of Isaiah concerning the suffering servant, the Messiah, God's Son. Turn to Luke chapter 4, starting in verse 16, and let me demonstrate this to you. Uh, Throughout Jesus' ministry, he was empowered by the Spirit. More on that later. But Jesus knew this very well, depended upon the Spirit, and was taking his cues from the plan established by God in the Scriptures. Luke chapter 4, we have uh, the first recorded public sermon of Jesus in Luke. And look at what happens. Um, It says, Jesus came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day and he stood up to read and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. And he unrolled the scroll and he found the place where this was written. The spirit of the Lord is upon me. And perhaps he leaned into these pronouns. Because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor, he has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And to break that silence that you could have cut with a knife, he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Jesus himself, Son of God, one with God, in his humanity, was not simply freestyling his ministry. (laughs) He wasn't making it up as he went along. He wasn't assuming that something was okay as long as his heart was in the right place, or whatever people say today when they're doing bizarre things in the ministry. No, Jesus' own ministry as Messiah had been announced by the Scriptures. Jesus himself, the Son of God, the Logos, the Word of God himself, allowed the Bible to dictate the details of his message and the shape of his ministry. 
how much more should we cling to the inspired, inerrant, authoritative word of God? If we are to represent Jesus in the world and serve him by serving his body, the church, and seeking to reach the lost, then we must minister for Jesus like Jesus. And Jesus clung to the word and let the Bible shape his life and ministry. By the way, the Bible that Jesus had was the Old Testament. And despite individuals that have sold hundreds of thousands of books, under the banner of evangelicalism, individuals, I I hate to say, like Andy Stanley, who has now come out and said we must untether ourselves from the Old Testament. He said further that the phrase the Bible says is not a thorough foundation for why we ought to do something. We must reject voices like that thoroughly, firmly, unequivocally. Jesus took hold of the Old Testament scriptures, held them up, showed them to the people, read them out loud, and did what they said. He operated in full obedience and submission to the Word of God, and He teaches us to do the same, and we must do so boldly and teach others as well. We cling to the scriptures, the Old and New Testaments, and we let them guide us. Now, Let's look now at Matthew's use of Isaiah 42, 1 to 4. One of these servant songs of Isaiah describing the ministry of the Messiah when he would come to earth because Isaiah is writing in the 8th century BC looking forward to the work of the Messiah. These are the words of God the Father talking about his son in the Old Testament being used by Matthew. Look at verse 18. Behold, my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved with whom my soul is well pleased. Behold, my servant whom I have chosen. Jesus' earthly ministry was announced by the scriptures, but number two, he was appointed by the Father. He was appointed by the Father to this redemptive mission. Matthew uses one of his favorite words, behold, or look. It's not in the original. In Isaiah, Matthew adds it to arrest your eyes and attention on the first word of this. He wants you to see that Jesus as Messiah was a servant. God's servant, his chosen servant, appointed to this task. Matthew is thinking of Jesus' humility. So this was the perfect passage to quote. At this point, look at the Father's servant, he's saying. Jesus, as God's Son, is absolutely equal to the Father, eternally sharing the Father's divine essence, which makes the shape of his earthly ministry that much more amazing. In his redeeming work, Jesus came as an appointed servant of the Father. In Isaiah 53, 11, God says, my righteous one, my servant, will make many to be accounted righteous. Uh, Jesus himself will say in Matthew 20, 28, that he came not to be served, but to serve. And Paul picks up on all of this and says in Philippians 2, 6, and 7, though Jesus was in the form of God, one essence, he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. You know, imagine that you were the co-owner of a business, one of two equal CEOs, 50% share in the profits and in the authority. And imagine that your partner comes to you and says, I have an idea. In the next leg of our business journey, why don't you call yourself my servant. We're going to put it on your business cards. I'm going to refer to you as that, and you can refer to yourself as that everywhere you go. We'll still be equal, but you can take a new role as my servant. How would that go over in the world? Just hearing that sounds ridiculous, 
Because as sinners, even as saints, yet with the flesh still remaining, we hate to not be given the full credit we think we deserve. And yet here is Jesus, the Son, second person of the eternal Trinity, equal in every possible way to God the Father, Almighty Maker of heaven and earth. And yet He willingly becomes a servant of the Father in His humanity, in His earthly redeeming work. And He does so joyfully. The humility on display is staggering. Now, Jesus is not just a servant among many. He is God's servant. He is the servant, God's chosen, uniquely beloved servant as God's only begotten Son. He has been appointed by the Father. This is part of His sovereign plan. While Jesus hung dying, some of the rulers jeered, Luke 23, 35, He saved others. Let Him save Himself if He is the Christ of God his chosen one. They said more than they knew. What they had missed was that God had chosen his beloved son specifically for a ministry of humble service and shameful sacrifice. And they couldn't believe that because chosen ones in the world's way of thinking are those who are spared from suffering and given only privileges. The shame of the cross sealed their rejection when it should have finally convinced them that he was indeed the suffering servant. If they had read Isaiah 52, 13 to 53, 12 with anything more than a cursory glance, they would have seen point for point for point for point for point that passage playing out in front of their eyes there on the cross. But they were more interested in their own exaltation than in rightly understanding the Messiah. They understood neither the biblical shape of Messiah's ministry nor his appointment by the Father as a humble, suffering servant. And so they jeered and they mocked. If Jesus was so humble as to come as the chosen, beloved servant of the Father, how much more should we content ourselves to serve only in those ways appointed by the Father? chosen for us by Him and affirmed in the community of the saints. We shouldn't be carving our own path and making assumptions about what we ought to do for God. We should be coming to Him humbly and allowing Him to guide and steer us and allowing His body to affirm the work that we do for Him. We should submit ourselves to the Father and see ourselves as humble servants. Jesus' ministry was announced by the Scriptures and appointed by the Father. But how did God set His Son apart in this earthly ministry as His beloved chosen servant? How was He empowered to live and die and rise as He did? Well, verse 18 continues, "...behold my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved with whom my soul is well pleased." I will put my spirit upon him, and he will proclaim justice to the Gentiles, meaning to all the nations of the world. Now look carefully at the second half of verse 18. It sort of slips right past you. I will put my spirit upon him. But you have to stop and circle that in your Bible because the fullness of our triune God is on display in one short line. God the Father will put His Spirit upon His Son. And then He, our triune God, will accomplish His worldwide mission of salvation and judgment in justice. This is the operation of our triune God on full display. I will put My Spirit upon Him. And He, in that state, like that, with the Father's appointment and and choosing with the Son's sealing by the Spirit and empowerment, then He will go out in His mission of proclamation. This anointing of of the Son with the Spirit by the Father is beautifully pictured in all three of the synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Turn back to Matthew 3, 16 and 17. I want you to see this for yourself. When it was time for Jesus 
earthly ministry to begin. He did one of the most humble things that he could have done. He went down to where John the Baptist was baptizing sinners in the Jordan. And Jesus, despite being sinless, came down among the crowd to associate with those sinners and then went right down into those sin-stained waters of the Jordan to associate with us further to be baptized. It was a baptism of initiation for his public ministry. And something amazing and triune happens. Here is where God is seen clearly. When Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water and behold, the heavens were opened to him and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Does that sound familiar? It's Isaiah 42.1. At Jesus' baptism, God the Father quotes out of heaven, Isaiah 42, 1. At Jesus' baptism, the Father sent the Spirit to uniquely anoint His Son for earthly ministry, to set Him apart and empower Him. The Spirit of God rested on Him, stayed with Him in a unique way moving forward. And the Father declared His loving satisfaction with His Son. It's a bit of an aside, if God had a favorite verse, you could argue that it was Isaiah 42.1, because there's seven times in Jesus' uh, earthly ministry that we have recorded here where the voice of God the Father speaks from heaven seven times that are recorded. Um, Six of them are simply the three recollections of the baptism of Jesus and the three recollections of the glorification of Jesus, the transfiguration of Jesus. And in all six of those moments in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Jesus is, uh, the Father is heard quoting Isaiah 42.1. The Spirit saw fit to record that six times in Scripture. The only other time is God answering Jesus directly in John 12, assuring him that he would glorify his own name through the Son's death. Six times in Scripture, it is repeated that the Father spoke these words from heaven, both at Jesus' baptism and His transfiguration. There's something very special about this verse to God and to us. Jesus' humanity was conceived by the Holy Spirit, Luke 1.35. He was anointed by the Holy Spirit, Luke 3.22. He was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted, Luke 4.1. He returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee, Luke 4.14. And the first words of the first recorded sermon in Luke are, as we've seen, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Just as clear and self-conscious and communicated as the fact that Jesus' ministry was laid out in Scripture, was the fact that Jesus' ministry was empowered by the Spirit. He knew it, and He wanted others to know it. The Father, by the Spirit, was empowering the work of the Son as our triune God worked out His plan of salvation upon the earth. Jesus' earthly ministry is announced by the Scriptures. He was appointed by the Father, and he was, number three, anointed by the Spirit. Anointed by the Spirit. Jesus' earthly ministry was carried out in humble, daily dependence on the guidance and power of the Holy Spirit. How much more should we refuse to operate in our own strength or depend on our own natural abilities? How much more do we need to abide in Christ and obey the Scriptures and rely on the guidance and empowerment of the Holy Spirit to do all of this? Now, let me ask a tricky question. Can we do things in the flesh by the power of the flesh with the cleverness of our mind? Well, the sad answer is yes, a lot of things. And if we apply ourselves in that way, do you know what we build? Ziggurats in the plains of Shinar to worship the stars. What we build is the Tower of Babel. What we build are things that are designed to show off our strength and cleverness and ultimately worship ourselves. Jesus would have none of that. 
He came as announced in the scriptures, appointed by the Father and anointed by the Spirit in humility. He would depend upon the Spirit to fulfill the Father's plan for the Father's glory. Oh, how much more do we need to carefully depend upon the Spirit each day to understand God's Word and to apply it carefully to please the one who has sent us. Jesus' earthly ministry is announced by the Scriptures, appointed by the Father, anointed by the Spirit. But despite the infinite power available to Him, His ministry was, number four, accomplished by sacrifice. It was accomplished by sacrifice, or you might write in that blank, service and sacrifice. Look at verse 19, back in your text of Matthew 12. He continues quoting from Isaiah 42 and says, He, the Messiah, Jesus, He will not quarrel or cry aloud, nor will anyone hear His voice in the streets. Now, obviously, Jesus strongly denounced sin and self-righteousness. Obviously, many people heard His voice as He taught aloud at times to large crowds. Obviously, He was bold in declaring the truth, even in correcting error as I've done earlier in this sermon. But what does this mean then, that he will not quarrel or cry aloud, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets? Well, it means that he didn't lead a revolution in the streets. It means that he didn't foment rebellion against the Romans. He didn't forcibly overthrow the Jewish leaders. Jesus told the Pharisees in Luke 17, 20, the kingdom of God is not coming in ways that can be observed. He explained to Pilate in court, John 18, 36, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I may not be delivered over to the Jews, but my kingdom is not from this world. Uh, Jesus' disciples tried to take out a sword and fight for him. He told them, put that away and healed the poor guy's ear. If you can believe it, Jesus didn't even teach his disciples how to sling carefully crafted zingers at all of his enemies online. Can you believe it? That wasn't part of ministry training. You wouldn't know that by watching YouTube today. But Jesus taught openly, passionately, humbly, and taught his followers to do the same. Bold, you bet you, bold as lions, clear, yes. But they weren't looking for a fight. They weren't picking fights. And if a fight was picked with them, they preached the word and moved on. Jesus didn't fight fire with fire. He fought fire with living water, and so should we. This is how he lived. This is what his ministry looks like. And our lives must too. During his earthly ministry, Jesus was gentle and lowly in heart. Matthew eleven twenty nine. 29. Exactly as announced in Scripture, appointed by the Father and empowered by the Spirit, Jesus in His earthly ministry would die on a cross before donning a crown. He would embrace humiliation now for exaltation later. He didn't try to win every fight. He spoke truth into them and moved on, even withdrawing to the countryside to continue teaching without getting killed because his time had not yet come. He embraced humiliation now for exaltation. In fact, Jesus' earthly ministry was one long, humble descent from heaven down to earth, from earth down into those sin-stained waters of baptism in the Jordan, from association with sinners down into condemnation by the courts, from condemnation down into the grave by way of a brutal public execution on a cross. Jesus' ministry was not accomplished by sedition or struggle. Jesus' ministry was accomplished by sacrifice. And this must shape the way we serve Jesus today. He poured himself out in service even unto death. And this ought to shape the way we live in the world that God has made before the people that Jesus has called us to witness to. That's exactly why Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy 2, 24 and 25, the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone. 
The Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. This is not to say that we shouldn't strongly condemn evil and succinctly correct false teaching, as we've done. But it is to say that we need to stop pretending that this verse isn't in our Bibles. The example of Jesus is set and it's pulled out and commanded to us by the Apostle Paul. We need to learn to correct even our opponents with gentleness, boldness, yes, always, clarity, you betcha. Back down for the truth, never. But if we don't look and sound something like the shape of Jesus' earthly ministry as we do it, something is desperately wrong. This is to say that we must serve the master like the master served. And he didn't quarrel or cry aloud in the streets. It wasn't about picking and winning every fight or leading a rebellion. His obvious humility is what drew the hurting and the broken and the burdened to him. Look at verse 20 with me. A bruised reed he will not break. And a smoldering wick he will not quench. Number five, Jesus' ministry was always attentive to the broken, attentive to the hurting. Jesus, for all of his busyness, was always attentive to the suffering. He always had time for them, and they were never a burden. One writer said the reed, growing by millions in every marsh and riverside, was a type of commonplace insignificance. See, reeds were used for a lot of things in the ancient world because they grew everywhere. Things like, oh, pens of a sort or or, uh, marking tools or measuring rods or flutes and a bunch of other things. They had to be whole, usually to be used, and they were notoriously brittle. And so a craftsman would just gather a big armful of them and go, this one, nah, it's bruised. This one, a little crack. Maybe this one, this will work. But when he would start to work with it, it would break a little. He'd throw it out. You'd simply discarded the ones that weren't perfect because there were millions. Now, in the ancient world, lamps were used by almost everyone on a daily basis as well. Lamps were everywhere, little cup-shaped things with a hole in the end. You put oil in it and you put a wick in it. But if you've ever burned candles, you know this, sometimes a wick doesn't work right. It kind of sputters and it gutters and it puts off smoke. And in the ancient world, where lamps were everywhere and wicks were everywhere, if a wick was annoying because it didn't work right, you just snuffed it out, threw it away. Because they were ubiquitous, they were everywhere. He uses two models of things that you simply discard if they're causing too much work or are a little bit bothersome. The world treats fragile, struggling, broken people in the same way. They are seen as a burden and quickly discarded. Wow, there's eight billion of them. Let me just find another one whose problems aren't quite as obvious. Now, let me just find another one who, whose uh, pain isn't so clear. On the, now, let me find another one whose sin I understand a little better. It doesn't seem so icky to me. Uh, let me find another human who isn't uh, so annoying all the time. It's eight billion. Just throw this one away and find a new one. But what the world calls a burden, the Lord calls beloved. Psalm 147, 2 and 3, the Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the outcasts of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. Jesus doesn't spurn or ignore those burdened and brokenhearted by the pain of the world and by their own sin before the Lord. These he came to save. It was those he looked at as he planned this mission and came in humility as a servant to die. In fact, they of all people are most likely to come humbly into his presence carrying the one sacrifice that God seeks most. Psalm 51, 17 says the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. Those that the world would shun, Jesus came to save. 
Jesus came as the Father's anointed Son, carefully obeying the Scriptures in service of and sacrifice for all who feel the weight of their sin and then come to Him in humble, repentant brokenness. This is why He said in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, "'Come to Me all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest.'" Jesus discards no one. No matter how brittle or bruised or weak or smoldering, they are not an annoyance to Him. If they come repenting of sin and trusting in Him, He holds on to them for the rest of eternity. And He loves them. And He is near to them and cherishes them. They are not a bother. Bruised reeds and smoldering wicks are not broken and quenched. They are restored and stoked in his gentle hands for a lifetime and preserved for an eternity in heaven. Hymn writer Samuel Stone perhaps envisioned Jesus looking down on the outcast, the sick, the burdened, the suffering, sinful nobodies despised by the world like you and like me. And he described Jesus' response. From heaven he came and sought her to be his holy bride. And with his own blood he bought her, and for her life he died. No, no, the bride of Christ, the church, is filled with bruised reeds and smoldering wicks that Jesus will protect from themselves and others in the world and bring to hell and preserve for eternity. Jesus' ministry was always attentive to the broken, the hurting, the suffering. But one day soon, when Jesus has gathered in the full number of his church, the bride, then he will come forth in power and victory never before imagined upon the earth. And this is important. Verse 20 continues, until he brings justice to victory, and in his name the Gentiles will hope. There is an until, and then there is a a look at the global accomplishment of Jesus' mission of salvation and judgment unto justice. Until he brings justice to victory. In the end, the servant, Jesus, will bring full and final justice to all the earth and no one will stop him. Having saved sinners from every nation, all tribes and peoples and languages, he will bring forth justice to victory. John has given a preview of that great and terrible day in Revelation 19, 11 to 16. I want to read it to you. There comes a day when the um, suffering servant's ministry of humility is fulfilled, and he rides forth as the conquering king in all his glory. And when he does, not one human on earth will know or care what China or North Korea or Russia or, for that matter, North America is doing. No one will be counting atomic bombs because nobody will care. Nobody will be obsessing over military machinations because none of them will hold a candle or a flicker to the power that is seen when this happens. Now listen carefully as I read. And then I saw heaven opened and behold a white horse and the one sitting on it is called faithful and true and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe, dipped in blood, and the name uh, by which he is called is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. And from his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations." 
and He will rule them with a rod of iron, and He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty, and on His robe and on His thigh He has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. I saw a clip from years ago, I think it was supposed to depict Superman. And he stood there with a camera trained close on his face as someone shot a pistol at close range. And with, uh, you know, CGI, they showed a bullet going in super slow motion and bouncing off Superman's eye. He didn't even blink. If it were possible, when Jesus began his return, for every nation on earth to launch every weapon that we have ever created and will ever create all at the same time, and they all culminated together on the flank of Jesus' horse, it wouldn't blink, let alone him. Because the power of the Almighty will prove irrelevant and puny and pitiful and stupid all that we have feared as human power. Oh, friends... Jesus will come in victory. We need to stop reading the news and fearing and start reading our Bibles and rejoicing and going forth fearlessly in the name of our humble servant, Jesus. We need to go out into the world not worried. We don't have to yell. We don't have to shout. We can simply speak His truth plainly. And when people don't like it, we can love them and say, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing or saying. And if they want to harm us, we just point to him. What can they do? Kill us? We'll be instantly in the presence of our infinitely powerful Father. Stop watching the news in fear and start reading your Bible with joy and boldness. Our King will return. His mission will be finished. He will bring it all to final and full consummation, and no one will stop him. The ministry of the suffering servant becomes the ministry of the conquering king soon. Is that in a year or a thousand years? I don't know. I don't know. But I don't see anything in my Bible that prevents the inauguration of the end. Jesus sits now at the Father's right hand interceding for us. He will reign in his mediatorial kingdom in perfect faithfulness and patience until he ushers in his millennial kingdom and a new heaven and a new earth. But he was content on earth with humility and sacrifice, and he is content now with long-suffering and patience for the sake of the salvation of more and more sinners all around the world. Number six, friends, Jesus' ministry is awaiting consummation. His ministry is awaiting consummation, and nothing will stop it. From the wilderness temptations onward, Jesus faced temptation to rush the process But he did not give in to those temptations. He stayed the course, went all the way to the cross and the grave and the empty tomb and the right hand of the Father. He feels no such temptation now in his glorification. He knows what it feels like and sympathizes with us in our weakness, but now he sits patient, waiting for the day appointed by the Father for his return to gather all of God's children to himself in power for the beginning of the eternal state. Oh, what we look forward to. Jesus' ministry is awaiting consummation. I want to end with these words from Philippians 2, 3, and 5. The Apostle Paul obviously had thought long about these things. He knew that he was the chief of sinners. He could see the log in his eye far better than the speck in anyone else's. But he had thought long and hard about living like the Lord Jesus Christ and doing ministry in ways that were shaped like Jesus' ministry. And in all of his letters, he was urging his churches to live lives that are shaped by Jesus' earthly ministry. And he summarizes it something like this. What Paul says to the church in Philippi, I want to say to you, church family here at Living Hope, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Having this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. In fact, I want to read more of that for you. You need to see all of this in its beauty. Paul says, having this mind 
among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Listen, if you are in Christ, then you already have His Spirit, and you can live like Christ in this broken world. You have the riches of spiritual strength that you need already, Ephesians tells us. So listen, it's yours in Christ Jesus, verse 6, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant and being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him um, the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. With our eyes trained like this, this morning on Jesus and his, the shape of his earthly ministry. Why don't we all grab hold of our passage for this morning as well as Philippians 2, 1 to 11, and look again at Jesus' descent into abject humility and service and ask him to make us as individuals and together as a church family more like Jesus in his humility and gentleness and service and boldness in the truth. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your love and your grace and your patience with us. Father, we thank you for the love that you displayed in Christ in his earthly life and on the cross empowered by your Spirit. Oh, Father, we thank you. By your Spirit again, would you empower our flesh, Father, empower our lives to glorify you as we represent Christ and serve others. And Father, we need Galatians 2.20, our memory verse for the month, to be true, and it is your work in us. Father, would you make us as a church family more and more into the shape of Jesus and his earthly ministry. We pray this in his name and for his sake.